Well, good morning, Grace Church. Um, thank you for joining us this, this Sunday morning from Dothan, Alabama at Pastor Richie's house. Um, uh, we're glad that you were able to, to join uh, with us this morning. If you are new to Grace Church, uh, if you would just comment on that Facebook Live feed, uh, someone from our church will get with you, tell you more about our church. And uh, we are still on mission. We're still going. We're still on mission to teach God's word invest in others and mobilize God's people. If you were with us last week, uh, we announced how we we're going to be a part of a church plant in Panama City this coming year. And so the mission is ongoing and we are still in the business of mobilizing God's people. So uh, we would love for you to be a part of our church and, uh, and, and be a laborer for, for the mission. Um, a couple of announcements um, as, and we'll continue our worship service this morning. If you are a student and great student, uh, Mr. Colin Dollar is going to have a Zoom uh, Bible study with y'all at 4 p.m. today. Um, Miss Sarah is going to do a Grace Kids um, uh, service for our kids this Wednesday night at 6.30. And then Sunday school is going to be uh, starting next uh, Sunday at 9 o'clock. Uh, Mr. Eric Barroso is going to be teaching uh, Sunday school. So. Uh, we'll, we'll send you more information about that if you are in Grace Kids, Grace Students, or uh, uh, it'll all be on Zoom, okay? Uh, if you want to uh, give uh, this morning, you can worship the Lord by going to our, our website at www.gracechurchbonifay.org. You can give online. Uh, right there, there's a, a button that says Give Online, or right on our homepage, uh, you can give right there. Uh, or if you if you are one of those people like me that like to write a check and send it in, you can send it to Grace Church at P.O. Box 1206, Bonifay, Florida 32425, and um, we will get that uh, your gift and and uh, put it to good use. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to bring up Evan Sammons, and he's going to start our worship service this morning. Good morning, Grace Church from abroad. Um, we're so excited that even during the midst of this crazy time, um, we're still able to come together and worship. Um, so we're still going to worship the same God. He's never changing. Uh, and we're praying today that through this sermon, he'll be able to work in all of our lives. So if you would, sing with me wherever you're at.
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, Brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we praise you because you are holy, you're worthy of all of our praise, um, and you're worthy to be rejoiced in. And so, Father, I pray that we would not be anxious during this time, but we would trust you as um, the sovereign and all-powerful God who is also um, caring for us. Father, I pray that you would help us continue to worship and be attentive to the preaching of your word. Um, Help us repent and live as those who um, love you well and delight in you. And Father, um, just help us as we continue to worship. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let's continue singing. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the
we put all of our faith, God, in your foundation will never fail us. So God, I pray today, Lord, that um, you would work in a miraculous way through your word, God, that you would enlighten our hearts to the truth of the scripture, and Lord, that we might be attentive and quick to obey its words. God, I pray that you would uh, fill Dr. Allen with your spirit as he's preaching, God, that he might uh, use the studies that he's had this week in order to present this message clearly and concise, Lord, so that um, the saints may be edified and those who are lost may come to salvation. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Evan. Get all of my paraphernalia gathered around me. Seems that I have more today than usual, but that's all right. We'll make it all fit on this small table and we'll be ready to go. Glad you're with us today, and I am glad to be continuing through the book of Romans. You know, it was good for us to kind of put Romans on pause and look at the spiritual gifts found in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 12 for the past 7 or 8 weeks. But as you know, that's kind of not my forte in preaching. It was more topical. Uh, we did biographical sketches each Sunday. 
But what we are about to resume today in preaching verse by verse through the rest of the book of Romans is more um, suited to my style of teaching and preaching. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting back into it. And we start today with verses 9 through 21 of Romans chapter 12. So let me read those verses and then we will depart from there. Paul says in verse number nine, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, regardless of what some folk think, uh, preaching is an exercise that's kind of like wine making. You know, folk think that preachers are like a Coke machine. You press a button and out comes a sermon. But that is far from the truth. I start every Monday morning absolutely on empty. If you were to put a gun to my head this afternoon and say, preach the next verses in Romans, Romans chapter 13, I would be hard pressed to do that. Uh, you've got to live with the text. You've really got to worm your way down into all the peculiarities of a text before you understand what that text is meaning and what was in the mind and in the heart as far as the intent of the author when he penned that passage. You see, that's our job as Bible expositors and as Bible teachers is to teach what's known as authorial intent. And the text today can never mean something that the author did not intend for it to mean when he wrote it over 2,000 years ago. And that is a process, and it takes a while. And I started on Monday and Tuesday thinking, my Lord in heaven, what is there in this passage? I see nothing of any relevance because that's normally where I start. And then by the time I'm through with that text, I have more than I can say in any given 45 minutes allotted for a sermon. So let's kind of start where I started with this text this week and what I call a windshield survey or a high flyover of this passage to try to see what some of the particular nuances of this passage happen to be. Now, I, I teach my preaching students uh, a little saying about nuances in a text. And here's what I teach them. I, I try to get them to understand that spiritual nutrients are contained within scriptural nuances. So I try to train my eye to see nuances in any given passage. Now you may say, now preacher, what is a nuance? Well, a nuance is, is some peculiarity that doesn't fit the normal flow of the language or the context or the subject or something like that. And when we find nuances, we are well on the way to cracking open that text to where we can penetrate and kind of understand what the original meaning is so that we can make personal application of that passage in our lives today. So here are some nuances as it relates to 
Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I think it's interesting that Paul comes right out of the chute. He opens the box talking about love. And that's Paul's pattern when he speaks of spiritual gifts. He does that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. After talking about the ministry and manifestation gifts contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he puts love in between 12 and 14. Uh, we can't hear this enough. We can be the most gifted individual on planet Earth, but if we are not using and employing our spiritual gifts as prompted by the Holy Spirit of God, motivated in love, then we are nothing more than a clanging symbol. Uh, Paul says we're almost without value as it relates to the kingdom uh, if we're without love. So he does. He opens this section on the hills of spiritual gifts with this concept of love. And then he gives us 24 rapid fire descriptions or admonitions. Now get your mind around that. Paul, like a machine gun, shoots successively, boom, 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 24 times. Now he gives us enough in this passage to load our wagon for the next several months. 24 of these. Beyond that, he speaks in these 24 admonitions, sometimes in couplets, he'll put two together. Sometimes he speaks in triplets, he puts three together. Sometimes he uses antithesis or an antithetical instruction, a construction where he says, do this, do not do that, or do not do this, do that, and trying to get us to see what it is that he is communicating. He also, in this passage, gives us three distinct words for love. And we'll look at those three distinct words because that's not by accident that he does that. And then I think the most outstanding nuance or feature of this passage is that Paul uses 20 participles. Now, a participle, as you know, is a part of speech that normally modifies or describes something else. And these participles, all 20 of them, are nominative, nominative masculine plural participles. And I'm going to show you the best way to translate that, particularly as it flows to us right from the Greek New Testament, because uh, it doesn't come across in our English versions. Now, please hear me. Do not hear me being critical of our English versions. But there is no way that an English version or translation can get its arms completely around what God put in the Greek language. Just cannot. It would be like me going outside of my house right now and trying to hug my entire house. All I can get in is just a, 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 few, uh, per, a, a few feet, but there's a whole lot more outside of my house than there are, there are, are outside of my arms than there are inside of my arms. That's the way it is when we try to get English to totally encapsulate the original language of Scripture. And I do understand that when we're translating Scripture, part of the goal is to put it in the vernacular of the people or to put it in terms that we commonly use and to have it speak like we speak. So this passage in English, as I read from my New American Standard, is translated like we speak. But I'm going to put it kind of in hard, rough, uncut Greek for you today so you can see the force of these nominative masculine participles that Paul uses. Now, here's why Paul uses the participles. You see, these participles are descriptive of the people who are doing the action rather than focusing on the action itself. Now, most of these participles in our English versions are translated with I-N-G, and that puts the focus on the action. But now notice, Paul opens up by telling us, let love be without hypocrisy. If it were focusing on the action, we could then be a hypocrite. But by putting the focus on the person, what Paul is saying is this, what you do must flow out of who you are. You see, our behavior flows out of our identity. 
And the problem that we have so many times in our behavior is that we're trying to be something or do something that we are not. And get this, anytime you do something and it doesn't flow from your identity, who you are as a person, then you're being a faker. You're being a pretender. Paul would say you're being a play actor, a hypocrite, wearing a mask. So it stands to reason that Paul would use a participle describing the person rather than the action. And in these participles, what he's telling us is you be this type of person who this action naturally or supernaturally flows out of your identity. And you may say, well, Pastor Richie, God didn't make me like that, oh, but he's remaking you like that in Christ. Amen. You see, that's the good part of this. Uh, a sanctification is an ongoing process. The Lord's not through, and this is the person that he's making you in to be. So I want to speak to you today on this subject, getting real. Boy, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that over the course of the past month. Every time some new restriction would come out due to COVID-19, somebody would say, all right, this stuff is now getting real, meaning it's starting to impact who I am. It's starting to have an effect on my lifestyle. It's starting to cause me to make changes. And can I say to you that Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 20 is getting real. This is what real people look like. And I hate to use this term, but this is what real, transformed sanctified in the process of being remade in the image of Christ, people look like. It's just who they are. Flows out of their nature, out of their being. So let's look at these things. And boy, the, the problem, I think, sometimes with this text is to know what modifies what. There's no doubt that Paul is describing real people. And in this, this text, he's getting real and showing us how to get real. But to try to uh, superimpose an outline on this is, is almost futile. And there's a good many expositors who try to break this thing down between 9 and 13 and 14 and 16. And they say that verses 9 through 13 is, is how we re react and interact and relate to believers. And then verses 14 through 21 is unbelievers. But if you look at that, it really doesn't hold. I think it's superimposed because there would be a couple verses that are out of place if that be the case. You know, Paul uses the word one another, for example. And when he uses one another, he uses that. It's another nuance, by the way. He, he, he does it in verse 10, and he does it in verse 16. Well, if he uses it commonly to refer to how we interact and relate on a plane with other believers, then... If that division held, then it's right in, in place in verses 9 through 13. But where he starts talking more, you would think about unbelievers in verses 14 through 21. He uses it in verse 16. So it really holds to no solid, rigid outlining. But nonetheless, we're going to make some broad statements today about these 20 participles and these 24 rapid-fire descriptions of real people here in verses 9 through 21. Now, here's the first thing that I want to say to you as Paul opens up, and I think that everything else in this passage basically modifies the first half of verse 9. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. And everything else he's describing for us how we can love without hypocrisy how it can be genuine flowing from our being. And it's interesting to me that the word that he uses for love here is the word agape. Let agape be without pretending, without faking, without hypocrisy. Now, you know that agape is that divine God type of love that isn't dependent upon the object that is love, but it flows from the sovereign choice of the one who is giving the love. God has chosen to love you. There's nothing you can do to make him not love you. 
There's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. He agapes you because he is the holy God of heaven who chose to set his love upon you as an object of his dear affection. Wow. That's the type of love Paul says that we are to express. Uh-oh, problem number one, right? <laughs> agape. How can I be a person who expresses agape love? Guess what? Paul's going to spend the rest of this passage telling us. So here is characteristic number one of real people. Real people overbalance. They overbalance the love hate equation. Now, we tried to mail out the listening guide or send it out electronically, but for those of you who didn't get it, here is, here is description number one of getting real, real people. Again, real people overbalance the love hate equation. I can remember at Mississippi State as an agronomy major uh, studying agriculture. We had to take every chemistry that's known to man, and sometimes I think they invented some that aren't known to man just to torture us. <laughs> I mean, there's organic and inorganic chemistry, and I can remember balancing those, those chemical equations. You know, you, you just got to be able to balance an equation. But more important than, than balancing a chemical equation is balancing this love-hate equation. Let me show you what Paul's talking about. In verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. How do you do that? Here's what he says. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Our first two participles, let me give you the translation. I have left space on your listening guide for you to write down this literal rending of the Greek passage if you would like to do it. Here's what he says. Number one, be the ones shrinking back from evil. That's the force of the participle. You see how it focuses on the person rather than the action. So a literal rending would be, and there's some places in this text where, where it's translated that way, but the predominance, uh, the preponderance of times, it is not translated that way. Let's be consistent with that nominative masculine participle throughout this passage. Here's how it's translated. Be the ones shrinking back from evil. Now, if Paul stopped right there, we'd have a problem because we, we'd have a horribly unbalanced equation. If all we are doing is hating what is evil, here's what we're going to be. We're going to be a negative, critical, fault-finding, pessimistic, bitter person. We're going to be the person that everybody knows what you're against but nobody knows what you're for. Do you know anybody like that? I mean, you really have to limit your time around because they're so negative and so critical of everything and everybody. Well, guess what they're doing? They have unbalanced this equation. They're only living in the first part of it, the first portion of the equation. They're doing good at hating what is evil. Now, we all know somebody like that, but how about you? See, this is what God does to me in my study. Oh, my mind can go, to, yeah, I know some, I know, but wait a minute. That God says, this is not about me and you and him. This is about me and you. How are you doing with this? So how do you balance the equation? Here's the second translation of that couplet. Here's where he speaks in couplets, you see. There's two of them. Number one, be the ones shrinking back from evil. Now, here's the other half of the equation. Be the one sticking to what is good. Sticking to it. And the word that is translated in my New American Standard as cling to what is good comes from a root word in Greek that is, is glue. It means to adhere, to stick. It means to cling, hold on to. So you see, Paul was telling us that you can't just be a person that spots evil everywhere. You've got to have an eye for good and a heart for good, and you can't just shun, be repulsed by evil all the time. You've got to be drawn to something. We're pushed away from evil, but we're pushed towards good. 
And here's what will happen. If, if you are working in a place, for instance, where morale is in the pits, where, you know, you just work with a bunch of snakes who know not God and care not for you. If you don't have a good bit of inflow of good in your life, and if you're not sticking to something passionately, you will end up being influenced and you will be one of those people that are bitter and fault-finding and negative and critical all the time. Mm -hmm. You've got to have good that you are passionate about. Mm -hmm. People should know you more for what you're for rather than for what you're against. And here is that word again. Glue. And those of you who are listening today, I see Carrie Helsel on my screen. Uh, those of you who work with us in Brazil and are proficient in Portuguese, you know that the Portuguese word for glue is cola. Cola. It's glue. And it comes from the very same root word in the Greek that Paul uses here. As a matter of fact, when you're taking off in an airplane, the pilot will come up, come on the intercom and say, triple assault. Prepara para decolagem. Decolagem. There's our word again. It has the D-E up front, which is the negation, and then cola. You know what to take off means in Portuguese? It means to unstick from the earth. You're unsticky. And this is the word that Paul, Paul uses. He says you'd be stuck to what is good. Stuck. People ought not be able to pry us apart from what's good. There ought not be a jet engine with enough foot pounds of thrust to pull you off of what you're passionate about, the good in Christ Jesus. No matter what situation you're living in. Hey, hey boy, we got to put this in practice. There's enough evil around us, right? I mean, after you watch the six o'clock evening news, if you don't, if you're not careful, you'll end up being a hater of everything that's evil. But we should be a lover of what is good. So when it's getting real, we are people who overbalance the love-hate equation. Number two, real people are devoted to brotherly love. Devoted, as Paul says, to one another in brotherly love. Let me give you the literal translation of that as it flows from the Greek New Testament. Be the ones with mutual parent-slash-child love towards one another. It's the word here, he uses another word for love. It's not agape. Now he uses the word Philadelphia. And we know that the first part, phileo, is love, and uh, delph delphos is brother. So it's literally brotherly love. So he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And then I think this next participle here that's found in verse number 10 gives us a practical way that we can do that. Look what he says. He says, give preference to one another in honor. Now, right under your first translation, let me give you the translation for this particular participial clause. I translate it up front. Here's the word. In honor, be the ones putting others first. Be the ones putting others first. Now, we sometimes struggle with how to do that because naturally we all want our way. But you see, somebody who's real is not a person who always insists upon having things their way. They will defer to the preference of of their brothers and sisters in brotherly love. One of my mentors years ago taught me a principle, and, and you know, some things just stick in your heart, and this was probably, my goodness, 35 years ago when he taught me this. He said, he said, Rich, he said, always stand on scriptural principle. Never compromise a scriptural principle. He says, but most of the time, you are to yield to preference. Now, boy, just stop and think if we live by that particular axiom today, how much better things would be, not only in our homes, in our church, 
in our places of employment, if we really honored one another enough to say, you know what I want is really not important here, let's do it your way. Rather than saying, well, we've never done it like that before. <laughs> or, or uh, how many times have we heard this? Well, I just don't like those songs y'all sang today. Well, that doesn't come from a real person who is surrendering preference in brotherly love. There are some things that preference can let go. And that's what Paul tells us here, and that's a part of getting real. Now, again, I have to ask myself, because our mind will race and we'll run around the bases thinking of people who we know that won't surrender any particular detail of their personal preferences. But how many times am I like that? Mm. I'm telling you, I've been in the woodshed uh, this week over this passage of Scripture. Okay. Characteristic number three, I've got to be disciplined and move on here because this is rich and it's a big block of material. Paul tells us in the next place, he says, real people have focused energy. Now, let me get back to my original translation on that and see uh, what, uh, uh, oh yeah, here we go. Here's the, here's, here's the, the translation. Matter of fact, I have just put Original translations as the subpoint, because maybe these next these next participles modify this one right here. Notice what uh, how that goes when Paul says in verse eleven, he says, "Not lagging behind in diligence." Here's the first time he gives us the negative. He's told us what to do. Now he's telling here what not to do. So real people have this focused energy. And that first phrase, here's the way it's translated. I put it on your listening guide. Be the ones not slothful or slow or pokey. Be the ones, Dr. John, not hesitating. Not always having to sit around and make up your mind what you're going to do. I think in, in, in our churches years ago when we would play through 100 verses of just as I am, we were catering to these people who are slow and pokey and, and lagging behind in diligence. Maybe that's where that comes from. Paul tells us, don't be slothful, slow, or pokey. Now, you know, it's my practice to read a proverb a day corresponding to the date of the calendar. Yesterday was the 18th. Get this proverb. Here's what the writer says. He says, he who is slothful in his work is brother to him who is a great destroyer. And stop and think about that. You know, we tend to think, well, I'm not doing a whole lot of good, but I'm not hurting anybody either. Or this action may not be profitable, but it doesn't hurt nobody. That's not the way to measure things. A, a slothful hesitating, never stepping up to the plate type of person. The, he, the, the writer of Proverbs says is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Man, 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 man. Now just stop and think about that in the context of, of evangelical Christianity in the United States of America where 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. Is it any wonder why the church is, is as ragged as she is today? Because we've got a lot of destroyers. Mm -hmm. If you're not at your duty station, as Paul's going to talk about here in a little while, serving the Lord with diligence, then you may be counted as somebody who's destroying the work. He who is slothful in his work is brother to him who is a great destroyer. Well, here's the, the translation one more time. Be the ones who are not slothful or slow slash pokey. Now, verse 11, he gives the converse of that. He says, fervent in spirit. So here's the literal translation of that. Be the ones aglow. Did you get that word? Aglow. 
burning with passion in the spirit. Now, my New American Standard, probably as your version of scripture, translates that word spirit with a little s. But most scholars feel like this should be a capital S, and here's the reason grammatically. When it refers to the human spirit, there is no definite article in front of it. But this reference to spirit in the Greek text has the definite article. And it makes sense to me because, listen, there's, I don't have it within me to be a glow in my human spirit apart from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, the one who brings life to my dead spirit. He's the one that makes me passionate about Christ. He's the one that makes me want to load up on a 757 and fly to the uttermost parts of the earth, taking the gospel to those who have not had an opportunity to hear. He's the one that energizes me over a text and scripture. He's the one that causes me to be a language geek as it relates to a, a scriptural study. He's the one that does all of that. If it were up to me, me and my spirit would look like my old bird dog Louie sacked out on the couch right now. <laughs> That's what I would look like. <laughs> but he says, no, don't be the ones who are slothful, but be the ones who are aglow in the spirit. Now, here's the way it's focused. Notice the way he's getting focused and focused and focused. You know, we're not just to be a glow in the spirit about doing everything. You know people like that? I mean, they're hyperactive. They boom, 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 just bouncing around off of everything. No, we are to have focused energy. I mean, we've only got so much of it. Let's, let's focus our energy. Because energy that is unfocused is really useless. Hey, this. let me give you a good illustration of that. When I was a firefighter in Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, one of the things that you know we used to fret about was what is in this house that's going to explode and kill us when we're in there? Because when you're in there, you can't see your hand in front of it. Everything's by feel. You know, what are we going to sit down next to that's going to explode and kill us? Well, the enemy number one to a firefighter is an aerosol can. An aerosol can can kill you if it explodes when you're in a house fire in close proximity. But you know, folk used to talk about, about ammunition. And am I going to go, and, and yeah, we've, we've been in many house fires where guys had caches of ammunition. But here's the reality with ammunition. We had one of our guys come and explain to us one time why, you know, ammunition is a problem. There's gunpowder and stuff involved. But as far as a projectile going off from a cartridge in a house fire and killing you, the odds are very slim, if not non-existent. You know why? Here's what makes a projectile forceful. It's only forceful when that thing is chambered and put into the barrel because then all of the energy is focused down that barrel on the trajectory towards the target. That's what makes a rifle round so powerful. It's focused. You take that rifle round and just throw it in a fire where the gunpowder that's in it is not focused and it can just go poof. Then all your energy goes out and there's nothing to project the projectile. And I'm afraid we are like that so many times. We have a lot of energy, but it's not focused. You see, that's what these spiritual gifts were about. We can't do it all. We don't have endless resources. Someone was asking me the other day about funding a missionary, and the, you know, may God bless them, but they, they're not fitting the strategy and the mission philosophy of Grace Church or Link Up Missions. And I said, that's not our, and they, and they went to chatting me. Well, I said, look, we only got so many resources and we've got to keep them focused on what God has called us to do. If we help every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's out there, we're not even going to get, be able to get done what God's put before us. You see what I'm saying? Focused energy. And notice how that comes across. Here's the focus that Paul gives us. He says, fervent in spirit, there it is, a glow in the spirit serving the Lord. Now, why do we have the Spirit of God within us anyway? It calls us to be passionate about whom? About Christ and serving Him. So let me give you the translation for that. Here's what he says. Be the one serving the Lord as a slave. Literally, this is what Paul said in the Greek. Here's the participle. Be the ones slaving the Lord. 
But I wanted to add a little, I, 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 I went away from that literal translation because I, I don't want somebody to think that it means that the Lord is our slave, that we're enslaving him. No, we are slaving away for him. And that's how Paul sets it forth. So, you know, my goodness, the word doulos for slave, that's what we are. And we are to be slaving, be the one slaving for Christ. That's the focused energy. So can I ask you a personal question? In what activities or pursuits have you spent the majority of your energy this week? And if it wasn't slaving the Lord, then this text is immediately going to call us back to dead center. Because he says that's what we should be doing slaving for the Lord all right number next notice what else he says he's rapid fire admonitions in verse 12 he says this rejoicing in hope here's the way it, it translates from the Greek New Testament be the ones or no in hope be the ones who are joyful in hope be the ones who are joyful now you know that hope most of the time when it stands alone refers to our blessed hope which is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now brothers and sisters, that's something we can be joyful about. Hey, this world's bad, but something good's coming. Huh? I mean, abhor what, shrink back from what's evil, cling to what's good. We ought to be leaning toward the eastern sky knowing that he's coming back at any minute. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day! Wonderful day that will be. If we can't be joyful about that, and here's, here's something, even, even put more lighter fluid on your wood. If you're not, you know, if we're not the generation alive when he comes, it doesn't matter whether he comes to you or you go to him. You see what I'm saying? Because every one of us are going to fit one of those two categories. Either he's going to come back and get you, or you're going to close your eyes one day in death, and you're going to go to him. Thank God to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Had a man tell me one day, he said, Pastor Richie, if the worst thing that can happen to you today is that you drop dead of a massive heart attack, he said, before your body hits the ground and the dust settles around you, your next breath is going to be filled with the rarefied air of heaven's glory. There ain't nothing ought to be able to ruin your day. And that's why Paul says, in hope, be the ones who are joyful. Woo! Hey, the scripture has a lot to say about joy, doesn't it? Man, we got, we, we got to work hard to, to... Don't let me put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> but we got to work hard to justify being melancholy and depressed and eeyore -ing. I call it Y'all remember Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh? I know... Oh, bother. <laughs> I know a lot of believers. I describe them as Eeyores. Uh, some of them I describe them as sluggos. Uh, you know, they should, that, that personality, and that's a contrary to this text in every way. Now, I know we're not all, always on a mountaintop. I know that. But by golly, we're not always hanging out in a valley pitching a tent either. Hmm. Amen every now and then will help. <laughs> all right, here we go. Number next. In hope, be the ones who are joyful. In pressure, be the ones who are bearing the load. Here's what Paul says. He says, persevering in tribulation. Number one, the word tribulation means this. Here's the picture. It gives a picture of, of something grinding. You know, you remember the pharmacist years ago? In, in Brazil, they still call the pharmacist a chemist because they used to mix stuff. And they put it in these dishes and they take this crucible, you call it. You remember in chemistry class, you had a crucible. You had to mash things up. That is what this word tribulation means. And this word persevering, it, it means to get under the load and stay there. You got the load on your shoulders and you're bearing it and you're trying to get it to its destination. You're not just trying to throw it off. Persevering in tribulation. Number next, in prayer, and I didn't have room to put your scriptural reference on there, but you see it in verse 12. Paul says, devoted to prayer in our English translations. Here's my translation from the original. 
in prayer be the ones who are constantly, intently engaged. Constantly, intently engaged. You be that one. Church, you be the ones. And you know the other shoe's about to fall. I have to ask myself. I had 168 hours given to me last week by the Lord. You did too. How much of that is reflected in our constant, intent engagement in prayer? Well, I told you now, this text got in my business this week. Because uh, Paul loads our wagon. And he shows us what we should look like if we're getting real. And uh, we got enough to work on in this one passage to last us the rest of our lives. All right, number next. He says in verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints. The word that is translated contributing is the word fellowship, koinonia. It's the word for house, koinos, or oikos, uh, koinonia, all of those related. Here's, what, here's how I translate it. To the needs of the saints, be the ones fellowshipping. Fellowship, be the ones fellowshipping. If someone is in need, we fellowship with them in need by contributing to their needs. We share in their needs. Now, here's the other one in verse 13. Remember, I've done giving you two of the three words in this passage that are, that are words for love. We had agape. We had Philadelphia. And now get this one. I bet you've never heard this one. Because in verse 13, Paul uses the word philoxenia. They said spell. P-H-I-L-O-Z-E-N-I-A. Again, the first part means love. Xenia is the Greek word for stranger. So see, here again, he's not talking about simply believers in this first portion of the text. He's talking about a stranger. And here's what he says. It's translated in verse 13, practicing hospitality. We totally leave the stranger love out of that, but it's as clear as bell. And Paul uses these three words purposely. Philadelphia, Philizenia, agape. And here's how I have translated. As to love for strangers... Be the ones pursuing. Be the ones pursuing. Now what Paul is saying here is if a stranger knocks on our door, we shouldn't just be happy to help them. We should kind of be looking for, we should kind of be looking for strangers to help in the name of Christ. Man, it, wouldn't that be a ministry? Um, I remember Grace Church several Christmases ago, Dr. John got... I don't know, how many thousand? Did you get $1,000 worth of, of gift cards from Walmart? You remember that? Mm -hmm. we, we, bought, we went down to Walmart and got, and I think it was a $25 cards, and we bought a, a purse full of them, and we gave them to our people, and we said, here's what we want you to do over the Christmas season. You be, you be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God, and while you're out and about doing your business during the day, if you see somebody and God puts it on your heart to give them a $25 Walmart card, you go up and give it to them. See, that's love for strangers. I do, well, you know, it gets hard to, uh, to come up with a, a birthday gift or anniversary gift after you've done it for, by the way, today is Heather Allen's anniversary. She's been married 34 years. It gets hard. Heather, yeah. Heather is ate up with the gift of mercy. And one day, one Christmas, I did that for her. I gave her a handful of cards, and I said, Babe, I know you're merciful. You get more joy out of this than I can imagine. You take these cards, and, and on your while you're out doing whatever you do, going to Walmart and to bed and bath and beyond and all of that type of stuff, if you see somebody looks like they need a card, you get, she got more joy out of doing that than anything I could have given her for herself. And you see, that's kind of what Paul says here with this word philizenia. We're to be pursuing them. Jerry Newman, if you're out there in radio land, this word pursuing it gives the picture of dogs on the heels of their prey as they're given chase. We should be pursuing, just like your beagles are in hot pursuit of rabbits and Louie is in hot pursuit of quail. Um, that's the word that he gives us. 
But you know, more than often, I don't know about you, but I find myself shrinking back from opportunities rather than pursuing them. Boy, I'm not, I'm, I'm not here yet, guys. I, I, I got a long way to go. This text slays me. I got to hurry. I don't know how much time I have left, but nonetheless, here we go. <laughs> Philizenia, it's a good word. It's totally left out of our English translations, but it means strangerly loved. If Philadelphia is brotherly loved, then Philizenia is strangerly loved. As, for lo as to the love for strangers, be the ones pursuing. All right, next characteristic. Real people have unnatural speech. Look with me in verse number 14. Bless those who persecute. And by the way, the you is not there in the original text. It's just bless those who are the ones persecuting. It may not be you that's persecuting. They may be persecuting a brother. Boy, now that's harder, ain't it? I'd rather you persecute me. I can take it. Than I had you persecute somebody in my church or somebody in my family. I'm more apt to want to stand up and throat punch somebody for doing something bad to Heather than to me. But he just says, bless the, bless the ones who are persecuting, regardless of who they're persecuting. Now, give a gift card. Uh, yeah, give them a gift card. Look what Paul says here. Here's the way I, I translate it. It's the word eulogize. You for good, E, you for good, and then logos for word, good words. You know, we've talked about this before. When somebody gives the eulogy at a funeral, that means give a good word about the guy in the casket. I used to tell my folks, hey, don't make me have to lie at your funeral. <laughs> 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 Live in such a way I got some good material to share. <laughs> don't put me in that position. <laughs> Boy, I've done some where I've had to dig deep to eulogize. <laughs> Others, it just flows, you know. Some you gotta, you got to really hunt. But nonetheless, here's the literal tr translation. Speak good of the ones persecuting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. If, that don't, if that don't challenge us, yeah. speak good of the ones persecuting. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it's interesting to me that, you know, there's, we don't know if Paul's talking here. Naturally, we would think in Paul's mind, he's referring to those who are outside the church. He was a persecutor of the church. But can I say to you, the greatest opposition I've ever experienced in my ministry hasn't come from a lost world. It's come from folks who claim to be born-again believers. Mm -hmm. Dr. John Wilson and I this week were invited down to the Baptist College of Florida to do a, a recorded interview uh, on Grace Church. Uh, she is three years old, was three years old last Sunday. And they wanted to interview uh, Dr. John as to the church planning process and, and a few more things. And uh, Dr. Ellison, the professor of missions and church growth, was asking several questions. It was just a roundtable discussion. Here's what he said. He said, I want y'all to tell me what, what were your greatest struggles and opposition? And the reason he asked that question is because he looked at the camera and told his students via Video Connect. He said, the single greatest opposition in church planning, especially in the state of Florida, comes from, you fill in the blank. Where's it, who's it come from? Y'all know? I got a bunch of BCF students sitting right over here. They probably had Dr. Ellison in church planning. It comes from other churches. Now, ain't that a shame? Yeah. So when we talk about the word persecution, it's not just the outsider. Sometimes it's folk who are on the same side who persecute us uh, for something preferential in violation of two scriptures. Um, nonetheless, Paul says, speak good of the ones persecuting. Yeah. Then he also gives the negative to that when he says, speak good and do not condemn them. Verse number 14, bless those, speak good of those. And see, here, here's where he brings out the force, or, or where our English translations bring out the force of the, of the participle, those who persecute. It's the same form in these others that we've tried to translate. He says, uh, uh, bless those who persecute, Bless and do not curse or condemn. All right, 
We got to hurry up and get through with this passage so we can all sit in sackcloth and ashes in repentance. Because <laughs> we are all quick to, uh, you know, to defend ourselves and condemn and, and speak evil of those who are against the expansion of the kingdom of the glorious Lord. We can't get our mind around how somebody can do that and we'll tear them up and spit them out. But Paul tells us, don't do that. Hey, maybe we would get the pleasure of the Spirit of God on our lives. Mm -hmm. We aligned a little more closely with this passage of Scripture. I got to run. Next description of real people. Real, identify, real people identify sympathetically in all circumstances. Look what Paul says um, in verse 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice. They nail the participle there and weep with those who weep. You know, that, and, and that's just hard sometimes. But we got to be able to identify with people no matter what circumstance of life they're in. But, you know, sometimes, I, sometimes I, I'm just in one of those moods. I don't want to rejoice when somebody just had something good happen to them. Am I the only one that lives there? Because sometimes I think, dear God, I could assure you is that happening to me. <laughs> huh? But no, you go rejoice with them. And you go and weep with them who are weeping. And you know, the converse is true. Sometimes I don't want to weep. I think, God, no, I want to be in a good mood today. I don't want to go to the hospital. <laughs> but real people have such a bond with other folk until they identify with them. And I think I said it like this. Didn't I use the word sympathetically? Did I give that? Yeah, sympathetically. Because they identify, they put their feet in the shoes of people no matter what circumstances they are in. And they walk with them and identify with them. Thank the Lord for people like that. Look, verse number 16, real people have the right attitude. Look what Paul says. Be of the same mind toward, here's our word again, one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but here's my translation. Be the humble ones who associate with the lowly. And here's the negation do not be wise in your own estimation or in your own values or in your own eyesight. It's almost the exact verbiage that comes to us in Philippians chapter 2 in the Christ hymn. Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This attitude not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Let me see if I had a if I had a literal rendering of this, yes, do not be the ones exalting yourselves, but with the humble, be the ones willingly associating, is a literal rendering of the Greek text. All right, number next, and I'm, I'm done. Verses 17 through 20 are kind of all together because they all deal with vengeance. Real people... Break the cycle of vengeance. Hey, the buck has got to stop somewhere. If not, we're going to end up being the Hatfields and McCoys trying to one-up each other and get each other back. But Paul quotes the Old Testament, and he says this, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Never take your own revenge, verse 19, Beloved, but leave room for wrath. And you can see of God there is in italics, indicative that it's not in the original text. I'll never forget when I was a young man in ministry, there was this one guy who just didn't like me, and he was, he was bent on my destruction. And I had put up with it for about all I could, and I'll never forget, I called my pastor at the time. And I told him what was going on, how long it had been going on, how this man had doggedly sought after me to undermine and destroy and all this type of stuff. And boy, I, I was wanting, you know, the redneck in Richie was wanting to come out. And I'll never forget what my pastor told me. He said, he said, do not take this circumstance in your own hands. He said, the minute you take it in your own hands, God's going to give it all to you. But if you back up and you let God, and you make room, leave room for God, what God's going to do to them is a heck of a lot worse than what you're going to do to them. I mean, they've got to stand before a holy God and answer for that. Now, hopefully they will repent. But maybe 
Someone said one time that vengeance is so sweet that God wouldn't let us have it. I kept it all for himself. I, I don't know about the theological correctness of all of that, but this is what I do know. God says you don't, the word of God says you don't be the one who's repaying evil for evil. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now let me stop right there because my tech crew, I'm so grateful for them, for Matt Myers and John Wilson and uh, Laura Lynn and everybody that helps us, um, Anna Barroso that helps us do this tech stuff. If, if, if this was dependent on me, it just wouldn't happen. I want you to know that. But they, they are trying to hook up a video right now that gives the best illustration of this I've ever seen in my life. This happened not long ago when a police officer in Dallas, Texas named Amber Geiger was going home after her shift, walked into what she thought was her apartment. It had the right apartment number, but she was on the wrong floor. She thought the man in the apartment was an intruder and she fatally shot this man in his own apartment. And this video is about his brother. After the sentencing phase of the trial, watch what this young man does and says to this police officer. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I, see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. Again, I love you as a person and I don't wish anything bad on you I don't know if this is possible but can, can I give her a hug please please yes morning grace church um, I just wanted to to kind of tie up tie this all together and 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 end uh, by reading from from first John chapter 4 verse verse 20 and 21 um, where the Apostle John says if anyone says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. In this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So beloved, search your heart, search your soul. Is there someone in your life whom you do not love? Are there people whom you do not love? Um, and I would lovingly say that is sin that needs repenting of. Um, and praise be unto God who forgives us of sin. So love your brother as you desire to love God. For you cannot do one and do the other. Grace Church, you are sent. Amen.